Hello, I'm Tom Chapin. In a distant frontier of the Far East is a stark mountain enclave that has lured an intrepid breed of traveler for at least 5,000 years. To get there, they have to cross one of the most treacherous passes on Earth, climb to more than 15,000 feet, and more recently, skirt the battle lines of the Soviet-Afghan War. But for those who survive the landmines and the crossfire, the rewards are great indeed. Lapis lazuli, the semi-precious stone, is an abundant natural resource of Afghanistan. Dr. Whitney Athoy, an American adventurer, recently braved a trip to the oldest mine in the world, rich with a spectacular blue stone known as lapis. In the late 13th century, the great explorer Marco Polo spoke of this peak. He praised the azure stone within it, which has been mined in this remote corner of Afghanistan for more than 5,000 years. Today, the stone is called lapis lazuli. Since the days of the Babylonians, lapis has held a ritualistic value, celebrated for its deep blue color, unmatched by any other stone or jewel. Now this is top, top grade lapis. How much is it? This is 45,000 pounds, sir. The Afghans would call it Dada Jawa, top quality lapis. Dr. Whitney Athoy is an expert on Afghanistan. Have a look at this piece. It's from the same For room. years, the blue stone has fascinated him, and when by chance he found this Egyptian figurine in the library of the school at which he teaches, Whitney came to a decision. At the age of 48, he would attempt the most hazardous journey of his life, into war-torn Afghanistan to find the mountain of Azure. From London, his journey will take him first to Pakistan and the northwest frontier town of Peshawar. I was inspired by the travels of Marco Polo. But later I realized he'd never actually reached the mines himself. After years of traveling over much of Afghanistan, neither had I. And I don't know of any foreigner who has. Then, two years ago, in the bazaars of Peshawar, I met a man who made his living smuggling lapis from the mines. When I asked him whether I too could get to the mines, he simply said, why not? I spend the first week in the relative cool of my hotel trying to make contact with the people who control the mines and the smuggling routes. And now one of my friends in the resistance has asked me to meet him in Peshawar's old city. Across the border, in embattled Afghanistan, the mines have fallen out of government hands and now belong to the resistance, the Mujahideen. Hey. How are you? Hello, how Good are to you? See you, my friend. Good to see you too. <laughs> oh. Very good. Listen, thanks for coming down here. I really appreciate it. Masood Khalili comes from a family of poets, but now there's a war on, and he's a highly placed official in the resistance. Without my old friend's help, my dream of reaching the mines will come to nothing. But be aware of it. Two, two problems on the way. You can do with the high passes, I'm sure, but anti-personal mines on the way have been planted by Soviets by hundreds. They're still there. They're still there. Horses cannot go because of two things also, snow and mine. Snow and mine. Would your head also cannot go because snow and mine. Yeah. What I do, uh, I start from tomorrow writing letters, okay. calling Chitral, uh, making everything uh, ready to go. Do they have a, an office here 
Are you sure they have an office? For the lack of sure yes. This is why I told you I'll call in tomorrow, you go and see. To the office? Definitely. That'd be yes. terrific. Yes. From really be terrific. Here. So yeah. from here to the office and then from That's right. yes, the yes, office yes, to yes, Chitral yes, and off the... Yes. Masood tells me to find a building called the Shan Hotel in the Khyber Bazaar. On the third floor, he says, I'll find the lapis merchants. It turns out to be room 34. It looks like a carpet shop and smuggler's den rolled into one. The phones ring with orders from England, Germany, and the US. But the majority of stones go to Hong Kong, where they're made into jewelry for the international market. And every country we uh, export this lapis, uh, we sell it. Local traders and jewelers come and go, delivering enormous bundles of money for small pieces of uncut lapis. Surely somebody here can tell me more about the route and the risks involved. What are the conditions now? Do you know in the in the passes, in the Kotal? There, there is some snow, but the, the, the horse comes from Afghanistan in these few days. Oh, the horses are coming from yeah. Afghanistan. Yeah. So we should be able to go in the other yeah, direction. Yeah, you, you are able to go to Afghanistan. This route is starting to sound pretty risky. Will those passes really be open? In this part of the world, it's hard to predict what you'll find. On the roof is this year's very first shipment of lapis, arriving only yesterday. The stones are washed and sorted here. Only the top grades find their way to international jewelers. Grades three, four, and five are sold in bazaars throughout the Indian subcontinent. Next, the black market money exchange, dollars into Afghanis. Going to a normal bank might alert the Pakistani police. Crossing into Afghanistan without proper papers is a crime in both countries. Better to change money here, undercover in this hurly-burly bazaar. But even here the police have eyes, and I begin to feel like a fugitive already. And, uh, and give this letter personally to him, okay? In his hand personally. To my Yes. Because okay. it's, the, uh, it's the most important And one. these two also, one for the Garab Cheshma and another one for commanders of the road. Fine. I wish you all the best. Fine. Thank you very much. The flight north to the border town of Chitral takes only 45 minutes, but it seems like an eternity. The view is a bit unnerving. To the west is Afghanistan and the wild mountains of the Hindu Kush. In a few days I'll be traveling over that ground, and I wonder now whether I'm in over my head. It's hard to avoid thinking about the war being fought in those mountains. For a decade, Afghanistan has been a battleground. Right now, I have to concentrate on meeting a man down there named Nassim. My Peshawar contacts have arranged for a discreet meeting with him and his men outside town. The reason I've come yeah. is to visit the lapis mines in Badakhshan. Yeah, okay. And I have a I have a letter here from Masoud Khalili. You can to go by Mujahideen truck to post the police. It's no problem. With the Mujahideen truck? Mujahideen trucks. The Jamiat Sulami. What about the police? There's no problem. You speak uh, Persian. Yeah. You assume uh, like Afghanistan people. 
it's no problem. Okay, so I can hide in the back of the truck and get all the way to the to Galbar, and from there begin to go over the pass. Yes. The pass of Haji Mati. Yeah, yeah. Nassim is true to his word. The frontier police are suspicious of foreigners even approaching the border. I had this problem two years ago on another venture into Afghanistan. The next morning finds me hiding out, waiting impatiently for my guide and the horses. I let my guide, Haji Safad Mir, pass by. I don't want to show myself before making sure he's not followed. Oh, is he no trouble with the police? No, no, I, I didn't see the police, I escaped from them, you know. <laughs> Just I was running, I hide myself. <laughs> and they, uh, they didn't know about that. Good, let's go. Buru Bakhair. Buru Bakhair. It means, go well. The police are behind us now, but Afghanistan is still a long way away. We climb for nine hours before we reach the snow line at over 14,000 feet. At this altitude, all I can think about is the sheer ecstasy of getting across the first pass in one piece. We made it, huh? In Afghanistan. We descend rapidly, but so do my spirits, because now I have to confront what stopped me two years ago a breakaway faction who control the remote valleys of Nuristan. Well, sir. There is Haji Martin's village down there. Now, what should we tell them I am? What should we yeah, tell them about the You are the a show? journalist, you know. When okay, not a doctor. Who are they? I say they are all journalists. Okay. They are going to see Mujahideen Jinn, especially okay. Masood. Okay, do you think there'll be any problem down here? Oh, no, no, no. But there is a problem. The Nuristanis are very suspicious of all outsiders. They profit from the war by taking a cut from Mujahideen supplies. They call it taxation. Now it seems they want to tax us, or worse. At least this time I'm carrying my letters of introduction. At first, the new commander orders me back to Chitral. Luckily, the village headman remembers me from two years ago. But who's in charge here? Well, they tried to stop us. They said yeah. that the, uh, the permission from from Chitral was yeah. ambiguous. It simply said seven people. Mm. Didn't say anything about foreigners. Mm -hmm. And so they tried to stop us the same way they tried to stop us two years ago. Yeah. They say we didn't have the proper visas or the proper passports or this sort of thing. That's what happens when you have a country of 10,000 people who claims to represent the entirety of Afghanistan. So, what's the question of money or anything like that? I don't know. I think it was a question of power. Of course, power and money are first cousins, aren't they? <laughs> anyway, the Burim, we're off. Let's go. We 
travel into the very heart of the Hindu Kush, towards a province called Badakhshan. The war seems far away, but Soviet gunships and fighter planes have bombed many a convoy on these thin mountain trails. And still the convoys continue. What a hell of a place to fight a war. On the fourth day, we climb the pass called Kofir Kotal. It means infidel pass. I've been dreading it. Even the Afghans fear it. And this, they tell me, is the easy side. Even so, it takes its toll on men and animals alike. One in ten horses fall to their death on these passes. Fifteen thousand feet. My lungs are bursting, but the climb goes on. This is it. This is the last pass. From here it's all downhill, relatively speaking. Just two more days. <sighs> Up here, you can really understand the expression, roof of the world. My home in New Jersey seems a long way away. If the climb up from the south side was difficult, the northern descent looks impossible. The only way I know it can be done at all is by the tiny figures far below me. <laughs> Meanwhile, my guide, Haji Safat Mir, is looking ever more anxious. <laughs> There was a mine down here. Down there. Away diameter, diameter, nazdik bit pay to the balayish manda shava. Ten centimeters from my foot. Bale, 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 bale. Bale, 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 bale. How about this side? What should we, what should we do here? Here's the part Masood Khalili warned me about. The Russians have covered these northern trails with anti-personnel mines. Three horsemen were killed only a week before, making it even more dangerous. The mines are often disguised. Like a, like a cigarette box. A, a cigarette box, a pen. A pen. Uh, like a watch. Uh-huh. Uh, a gugurt. Matches. Batteries. Bale. They call this one a butterfly mine. Okay, well, you lead the way. One quarter of the horses lose their loads, and more than once, I glimpse the grinning teeth of a corpse trapped beneath the ice and snow. This evening, the war moves one step closer. A Soviet gunship becomes our home for the night. Helicopter, helicopter. Five or six years ago. A Muinyak helicopter in Hellas, but it's a new helicopter. Yeah, helicopter now good, but like 
trash so good that they need to fill up at all but six years of this thing it's been down here on the ground on the yeah, watch it for part time check it out rice bread and tea every day it's the same a snuff called naswar is the porter's one small pleasure my own small pleasure is to think the worst is over Seven days after crossing the border into Afghanistan, I ride into the valley of the Kokcha River. This journey is almost over, and the lapis mines are only a few hours away. Whitney, look, that's the mountain of lapis lazuli. Oh, we're almost there, Haji. Yes, sir. Oh, terrific! And tomorrow we can get inside. Inshallah, you will get inside tomorrow morning. Inshallah. I spend the night in what they laughingly call the Mine Hotel. The next morning I meet the miners, and my first question is, where are the mines? They smile and tell me to start climbing again. The mines are another half mile, half a mile straight up. We do it every day, they say. It takes only three hours up and back. They also tell me where they're from. The 12 villages in all share the rights to the mines. They seem a cheerful bunch, something of a relief after the Nuristanis. <laughs> <laughs> Several years ago, I visited the gold rush towns in an area called the Yukon, Yukon in, Canada. In, in, in Canada, yes. Of course, the buildings of there are brand new, but not like this. Well, they were brand new, but they fell down or burned down uh -huh. pretty quickly. They weren't, in some ways, they weren't as well built oh. as these, these, these yes. buildings. And there are two other differences. Maybe, yeah. One of them is, that these mines have been here maybe right. four or five, six thousand years, years. Old, yeah. and so people have been coming here continuously right. Right. with the gold mines. Yes, they were discovered quickly, they were mined quickly, uh -huh. and they were abandoned quickly. There's right. one difference. Oh, I have not none, seen a single here. woman none here. Yeah. in this town. Only men. In fact, one of the men told me that it's a town of bachelors. Ah, uh, there, yes. And I said, what do you do for recreation? Yeah. And he said, well, there's always the weekend. We go home on, uh, uh -huh. on the weekend. We need, did you see a piece of uh, lapis he has this No, no, let's see. Uh, I'm gonna show me this. this is a, uh, wait, this wait, is wait. a very good uh, quality, you know. It's uh, number one, look. Top grade. Yeah. Upgrade. This is from the um, uh, number one mine. How much is it? How much is it? How much is it? How much is it? 300,000 Afghani. He said it. How much is it? 40,000. We'll shake hands, okay? But then we'll put it in your pocket. Uh, you're right, right, right. That's a good idea. <laughs> a group of miners offers to show me the way up. At times, it's almost a vertical precipice. With ice, it would be suicidal. Two miners fell to their deaths from this very spot last winter. At last, I walk into a hole that someone began nearly 6,000 years ago long before the army of Alexander the Great fought its way across Central Asia. It's an eerie sensation as Haji and I step inside the Blue Mountain.
shovels, chisels, and hammers, the mining technology hasn't changed much. As I go deeper, the blue veins of lapis appear. You there, Hunchy? Here the safety procedures are pretty casual. The miners seem excited. Earning a living in Afghanistan isn't easy these days. They're taking the stone and they're wedging it away from the wall. They've exploded the, the dynamite. And now they're taking a hammer and chisels and wedging it away from the wall. And the smoke is so thick in here I can hardly breathe. He's sitting here into the eye of the map. And some of them, yeah, you can see behind us. Some of them are yeah. pounding away at, oh, the, yes, sir. at the at the good face, and yeah. some of them are. Are grading the lapis here yes. on the ground? Yes, sir, like that. But the place is a madhouse. Yeah. I mean, everybody was, everybody was yelling and screaming a minute ago. Oh, they're saying, saying uh, work, work, work. And we're way inside this mountain, full of blue stone. Right. It's uh, very blue and uh, yeah. like, uh, yeah. look. Look at this one. This one, yeah. What grade is that? What grade is that, Harvey? This is the second grade, about. That's only second, second grade. Yeah. First name is Oh, this is this is first grade. Look, right there. Look. Yeah. This is first grade. That's very good one. There were times I never figured we'd make it, eh? Yes. I figured we'd get stopped, or the mountains would stop us, or, or the Dalat would stop us. Oh, yes. All my life I wanted to come, and now I'm going to introduce what do you have? This little thing, you know what I have. Oh, a little yeah. figurine. Oh, this the... To the very place where it came from. Uh -huh. Here we are. Oh, Back from home. here. Right. From where Back did you home. get it? From where did you get it? After three and a half thousand years, well, from the United States, but it's Egyptian as we know. It's the Egyptian uh, figurine. And uh, I got it from the place where I teach, a place called Lawrenceville. Lawrenceville. From the basement of the library. Oh, right. right. <laughs> the sixth century. This is very happy, you know, the... Uh, it's got a smile on its face. Yeah. You know, it's, it's come in a great big circle. Yeah, very good. <laughs> this harvest of stone will now begin the long journey to Peshawar and on to the jewelers of the world. It'll be passed from back to back, from hand to hand, over icy rivers, snowbound passes, and fields of landmines. To reach the safety of Pakistan, the lapis will journey for seven days or more. And now that I've been to the Mountain of Blue, I'll have to do the same.